Good morning and welcome to the Terry Leadership Speaker Series. It's great to see a standing room only crowd for this event. Sponsored by the Institute of Leadership Advancement, this series brings accomplished leaders from a variety of places to our campus to discuss issues of leadership in a student-centered forum. Engaging in educational opportunities like this speaker series helps us create at the University of Georgia, I think, a world-class learning experience. And today, we have the honor of hosting Mr. Arthur Blank. Mr. Blank is a highly successful businessman, perhaps best known as co-founder of the Home Depot and owner of the Atlanta Falcons. But currently, his growing portfolio of businesses also includes PGA Tour Superstore, the Arthur Blank Family Foundation, AMB Group, Mountain Sky Guest Ranch in Montana, and MLS Atlanta, a major league soccer team that will get, begin playing in 2017. Certainly, while diverse in nature, each of Mr. Blank's businesses is run with a common set of core principles, developing customer relationships, treating people with respect, and supporting the surrounding communities. Mr. Blank has generously supported many important community initiatives. Through his generosity, the Blank Family Foundation has granted nearly $300 million to support early childhood development, education, the arts, parks, and green space. He currently serves on the Board of Trustees of the Carter Center, the Cooper Institute, and the First Tee. And while I was serving as university provost, I had the pleasure to participate in awarding an honorary doctorate to Mr. Blank. And that, as you know, is a singular recognition rarely given by the University of Georgia. Also joining us today for our program is Daniel Fields, a senior accounting major and a Leonard Leader Scholar in the Terry College of Business. Daniel is going to serve as the moderator of today's program. For the first half of the program this morning, Daniel will facilitate an interview with Mr. Blank, asking questions regarding his leadership style and his experience. And after that interview portion of the program is completed, Mr. Blank has agreed to take general questions from any of you in the audience. So now please join me in giving a warm welcome to Mr. Daniel Fields and especially to our special guest, Mr. Arthur Blank. Morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for. Uh, we got some seats in the front. Yeah. Those in the back, come sit up here. That's what he happened to me all the time when I was in college. I tell you to sit up front. So, sit up front. Well, Welcome. thank everyone for being here. We're definitely excited to have Mr. Blank with us. Thank you, President Moorhead, for the introduction. We're definitely excited to have you here. Um, thank you, Dan. So, like President Moorhead said, I'm just going to ask you a few questions, and we'll open it up to the audience for some more questions. The first I have. The first question is just about your experience with Home Depot, and when you look back on that, do you see any essential characteristics or decisions or values that you had during that time that kind of led to Home Depot's long-term success? Well, I think, um, I think the President alluded to that in his comments. Uh, I think the culture was um, what we established at the outset in our company, which goes back to 1979 when public in 81 probably was the most consistent theme of our success over the 23 years that I was there, retired in 2001. Um, and I really didn't realize it, and I'll tell you a couple of quick stories that help make the point. I remember in 81, when we were in public, I uh, had a visitor from Goldman Sachs, his name was Joe Ellis, who was a senior partner, um, one of the senior partners at Goldman at that time and um, had a world-class reputation on Wall Street and really throughout the world. And at lunch, Joe said to me, we were very successful in Atlanta, had our four, first four stores there, and um, said, you know, we begin to expand. He said, this unique culture you have and you know, the success that it's produced, 
you will not be able to replicate um, as you roll this model out. So I just sat there and listened and, you know, was kind of shocked and thought about it. And a couple of weeks later, I went to see my partner and uh, Bernie Marcus and said to Bernie, I had lunch with Joe a few weeks ago and Joe said, we're going to be dead in Atlanta. This is going to be it for stores. We expand it. We're not going to be as successful. We cannot replicate this culture, which was unique in our business. Um, and I said, we're really struggling with that. I said, the only way that we can do that is if we make sure that our leaders in our businesses uh, continue to understand the culture and live the culture, not only articulate it, but most importantly, live it. And so it was that point in 81 that we decided that the uh, move into management, into leadership, whether it be assistant store manager, store manager, regional vice presidents, presidents, uh, senior merchants, their first criteria had to be, do they understand and live our culture? Um, and if they did that, then they could move up in the organization. Because we understood that we could not make all these decisions. We couldn't be the daily ambassadors for our culture outside of the contacts that we had. So I think the fact that every day after that, everybody in our organization, when I left the company, there were 300,000 associates, we would call bled orange, understood our culture and lived it, was, was, um, it was really critical. Years later, after I retired, I was just another quick story on that. I was at Augusta playing golf, and um, my counterpart from Lowe's, his name was Bob Tillman, had retired and, and at the same time I did. And Bob knew I was there. I'm not a member. I was there as a guest. And um, he said, if, you know, if Arthur's here, have him come over and say hi to me on the putting green. So I went over and visited with Bob for a few minutes. And, he said, you know, we, uh, we used to visit about 100 of your stores a year, United States, Canada, Mexico, Chile, Argentina. We said, wherever you had stores. And uh, <clears throat> every time we did, he said, we could not figure out, you know, why your sales per square foot, sales per store were twice ours. We copied everything. We copied your merchandise mix. We copied your signing. We copied everything we could copy. But we could never understand the unique level of customer service you had in your stores. And that... I guess, you know, was kind of proof in the pudding that this culture that we had started to breed back in 79, understood how we had to promote it in 81 and maintain it, you know, for the next 300,000 associates, how we were able to do that. So I think culture was really the most critical part of, of our success. We did a lot of things behind the culture that made the business unique. We first started out, our stores were twice the size of anybody else in our industry. Prices were 25% less than anybody else. We had twice as much merchandise as everybody else. Everybody thought we were crazy, we were going to go broke. And obviously, uh, we didn't do that. But we were ser seriously considered to be crazy for a couple of years. We were fortunate because the company was private between 79 and 81. So competitors would come into our stores and look at you know everything they saw or think what they saw. Um, and realized the company wasn't going to make it. So they weren't terribly, you know, concerned about us, you know, long term. So. Well, great. Yeah. So you kind of talked about building that culture. And I think as a leader, that's kind of what you're, mm -hmm. you almost have to do. How do you go about building effective teams like that and finding the people that do believe in what you're trying to sell? Well, I think you have to really be very disciplined about uh, we began formal succession planning when we only had four, four stores. When I left the company, we had 1,300 stores. We were the second, second largest retail in the world, second only to Walmart. Uh, but we were very disciplined about that process that I alluded to earlier in that we made sure that when somebody got promoted, did they forget about talk the talk, did they walk the talk, did they actually live our values, were they ambassadors for our values, did they teach and train them, et cetera. So I think that really was the most critical part of of the success that we, we had. Great. Well, speaking of that team, I know we probably have a lot of football fans in the building. Right. Can, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Falcons. Sure. And all the perspective yeah. <coughs> things they have going on with the new coach and Dan Quinn, mm -hmm. right. the new stadium coming up. I know you have a lot to say about all that. Well, I, I think that uh, we, um, we're we excited about a new coach. Uh, his name is Dan Quinn, as, as, as Daniel said. Um, he comes from Seattle. Uh, he'd been in the NFL for about 14 years in a variety of positions. He'd been with the Seahawks for the last uh, two years. Uh, led the NFL in defense for both of those, both of those years. 
Um, when we went through the recruiting process, we, uh, we interviewed seven coaches. Um, Dan was our, our first choice, obviously. Uh, not obviously, but he was our first choice. He was the third coach we had interviewed. So it became difficult as we went on because the other coaches were being compared to you know, Coach Quinn. Um, but again, you know, my, my view of it, I mean, I let the football folks focus on the X's and O's and I focused on the culture. Uh, does he understand what we're about, about how we want to win, the kind of players we want to win with? Um, did he understand our, our vision for winning not only on the field but off the field? Did he understand also the, the need to support the, the game day experience with our fans and support our fan base? Um, so he, he got all of that, and those things were very important to me. Um, obviously, you know, the NFL is about productivity, about winning. Um, it is about wins and losses, and you have to win, and Dan understands that. Um, so he has spent, you know, basically since, uh, since the first of the year, right after the first of the year, um, beyond explaining from his perspective why they made the call that they did, the last call of the game, when, um, and thank heaven it wasn't on, a, on the defensive side of the ball, it was the offensive side of the ball. But be, beyond that, which he's, he's done, you know, uh, more from than he would like, um, He's focused on understanding our roster, understanding the players, getting connected with them, building a coaching staff that reflects his values and our own values. Um, we went through free agency, bringing in the kinds of players that, that he connects with, that represent you know, the kind of way that he wants to play football very aggressively, an attacking style defense, um, very creative uh, playing on offense, et cetera. So um, he's been great to work with, and we're excited about that. New stadium. Uh, we're spending $1.5 billion to build, uh, I think, will be the finest entertainment sports, uh, sports complex uh, in the United States, uh, one of the best in the world. Every owner probably says that in the NFL, was building a stadium, but in this case, my quotes in that regard come from people around the league who actually are required to come in and study our stadium plans and see if they operationally work for the NFL and for other major events we'll be hosting there. And those are the ones that have come to that conclusion, that judgment. So, you know, for me to hear that, it's great. Um, it's a unique location. It's, uh, it's downtown Atlanta. We have basically two charters. One is to build this um, great, unique stadium, and then it's to make a major difference in the community. The west side of Atlanta has been basically left behind um, for three or four, you know, probably for 30 or 40 years now, I would say. And, we and other partners are committed to making permanent changes in those areas as well, uh, not only physically, but probably more importantly in terms of human capital. Um, there's a variety of programs we're involved in doing that as well. Well, great. So <clears throat> you kind of talked about, once again, building the team and finding people that share <coughs> similar values, and obviously you did that with Dan Quinn. Can you kind of talk about how your values translated from leading Home Depot to leading the Falcons and to running your ranch? Yeah, I think there, um, I'll tell you another very quick story. Uh, my fiance is here, Angie, who's heard this story more than once. One of my, my probably my closest owner of the NFL partner is uh, Robert Kraft, who owns, who owns the Patriots. And when I bought the team in 2001, I had to go to New York to get my owner orientation. And the commissioner then was Paul Tagliabue. And Paul said, well, why don't you have breakfast with Robert? He's, in the, he's, in the, he's here today doing some other work. And so I said, great. So I asked Robert that question. I said, well, you know, is there anything I have to do differently? Because I keep hearing the world of football, professional football is very different than what we did in business. And he said, you're going to hear that. There's a Seahawks jersey right there, man. Dan, Dan Quinn would be proud of you. Good. Right. I'm, I'm not feeling very good right now, but Dan, Dan would be proud of you. But you look like you play football, too. So I don't know. But in any event, I'm sorry to get sidetracked. Saw the Seahawks jersey. But um, where was I, Daniel? <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, Robert, his advice to me at that time was involved in lots of different businesses. He said, you're going to hear that, but basically apply the same values that you okay. did, you know, to uh, Home Depot, to your franchise, and you're going to be successful. So, you know, we've, we've done that, and basically all of our businesses, our guest ranch, which the president alluded to, which is the number one rated dude ranch in the West, um, the Atlanta Falcons, our MLS franchise, which we be playing soccer professionally within two years and today, our PGA business, which is the leading golf retailer uh, today in America, and uh, all of our businesses are focused on on the, um, 
on listening and responding to uh, fans, to guests, whatever it may be, and really subordinating whatever we feel to whatever our guests and fans are, 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 are telling us. So um, when I bought the team as an example in 2001, uh, the NFL does uh, a ranking. There were 31 teams competing then. The Texans, Houston Texans, had a franchise but weren't playing at that time. And with a forced ranking, I remember the commissioner at that time, Paul Tagliabue, said to me, your team that you're buying out of 31 ranks 46. I said, Paul, that doesn't sound very good. He said, it's not very good. So um, about 40% of the stadium was empty for all of our games. And of the 60% that were there, half the people were rooting for the visiting team, which was really not very good either. So uh, when I bought the team, I went up to Flowery Branch, which is where the, which is where the not too far from me, where the Falcons are housed. And um, every associate in the building had an opinion about what we had to do to reach fans, et cetera, et cetera. And I, and I was very courteous, and I listened to the majority of them, et cetera, but I, I greatly discounted what they said. I said, the problem is, is at that time, Atlanta, well, Atlanta now is six and a half million. At that time, it was about five, a little over five million. I said, there's almost five million people that are not coming to watch us play football. So I'm going to actually spend some time trying to listen to them, as opposed to everybody in this building, because we were 40% empty seated at that time. And so I spent, you know, six months in a variety of ways talking to fans, polling folks, et cetera, et cetera, who were not coming to watch us play and finding out there was only really five or six issues that they wanted solved. And if I solved those five or six, we would get a good response. So we did that and we sold out every game other than a one year period of time where we had the issue with Michael Vick in 2007. We sold out every game since then. And it, that's a good lesson in listening and responding to people that are supporting your business. And really, so I told everybody, let's kind of get out of the way, let's listen to what our fans are saying, let's answer their issues and problems. And if we do that, I have confidence we'll get a good result, and we, and we did. So people would say to me, are you surprised the place is filled now? And I said, I'm not really sure why I would be surprised that it's if you have someone in the desert who's dying from thirst and you give them a bottle of water, they're going to drink it. So we found people wanted a bottle of water, and we gave it to them. So that was the reason we've had such success. Well, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. <clears throat> Can you kind of talk about just going more into detail with those values and how you instill those in the people you work with? Yeah, I think the most important thing you can do um, is, as a leader, um, and I think it's true of the president of the university or co-founder of Home Depot or Atlanta Falcons or any of our other businesses, is uh, understand what, what your culture is. Um, because the culture drives behavior and the culture drives everything that you're doing. And I think it's, uh, it's, 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 it's very, very critical to understand those, those cultural values and to reinforce them you know, by the expression walking, you know, walking the talk. Uh, talk doesn't mean a lot. I mean, it's nice, it's great. Some people do it better than others, but everybody pays attention to actions. Everybody pays attention to really what you're doing. So I think in our, in our case, in the case of Home Depot, I can give you examples of the Falcons as well or any of our businesses, but you know, leading by example and reinforcing the culture every single day and every single way that you can. So for instance, as an example, it's kind of a simplistic example, when I would visit a market and I spent probably 40% of my time on the road out visiting stores and I would go in jeans, I wouldn't go dressed like this. Um, I'd wear jeans and a you know, long sleeve shirt and a sweater, et cetera, et cetera. And I'd travel by myself, I didn't have 100 people with me. Uh, and I put an orange apron and I'd walk the store with the store manager and district manager and sometimes the division president. <clears throat> so I always, when I was walking the store, you might say it's a 130,000 square foot store, it might take you ordinarily an hour to walk the store, walk every aisle it is and look at all the merchandise and you know, talk to associates. It would take me usually about three hours to do it. And so the reason it would take me three hours to do it is along the way, if I saw, other than a Seahawks jersey, if I saw anybody else, that needed help, I would stop and say, you know, ma'am, can I help you, or sir, can I help you, what are you looking for, et cetera. And so it took me three hours, I'm only kidding, you know, I picked me on you today, I'm sorry, I apologize. You know I love you. I don't know you, but I love you, so. But, um, but I, I would stop and take care of, of customers in the store. And so, you know, this was, this was kind of reinforcing our, our culture that we didn't come first and I didn't come first is that the customers were the top of the pyramid. The pyramid looked like this, 
Gus was in the top, and myself and my partner Bernie were at the bottom. So by living that culture and making the store walk three hours instead of one hour, because you were busy taking care of customers, that reinforced to all of our associates, and they would say, you know, holy crap, if the founder is doing this, I guess it really is important. We must actually got to take care of customers. That's what we do for a living. So, you know, it's, there are many, many examples, and I would look for opportunities every day, and I still do every day in all of our businesses to reinforce our culture in any way that I can because people pay a lot of attention to what the leaders are doing. They pay a lot of attention to everybody else, but they really pay a lot of attention to what the leaders are doing in, in, you know, in your businesses. Cool, great. Um, can you kind of speak to how, <laughs> obviously, leading by that servant leadership model is a great deal. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of times it's not as easy as you may think it is, and sometimes you may not want to do it. How do you kind of force yourself through those times to... I actually think it's easier to do, to do that than not do it. Um, okay. And the reason I say that is that, you know, going back to the days at Home Depot, if you will, or any of our businesses, really, and I give examples in every one, <clears throat> is that if you make the business, you make the job into a numerical job. It's about revenue and bottom line and producing P-E ratios and getting the stock up if it's a publicly traded company or if it's not, just getting the value of the company up. That, frankly, is not very exciting you know, to associates. It sounds good and you know, et cetera, but it's not really exciting to them. So to me, in all of our businesses, it's about a higher purpose. So in the case of the Home Depot, as an example, you know, we would preach and believe <clears throat> that we were not about how do you maximize the sale. It's about how do you develop a trust relationship with a customer. So if we could solve a customer's problem for 50 cents versus five bucks or $500, we would do it. The result of that is that over time, customers really felt like, you know, these folks really cared about me. So when they got serious about doing remodeling in their house or a kitchen, whatever it may be, you know, they would come back to us. So for the associates, they understood it wasn't about how do you maximize the transaction and the sale, but how do you develop a trust relationship with the customers. And we had, you know, 40 million of them a year shopping in our stores. Um, you know, how do we get them to have that, that kind of trust relationship? So that, you know, that is important. We became problem solvers and, and fulfillers of dreams as opposed to, you know, how do you maximize sales in each of the store, et cetera, et cetera. And good behavior then drives good results. Same thing with our football team. It's about creating a great game day experience for our fans. It's about having a competitive team on the field, having an organization, a franchise, players, coaches, and staff that are involved in the community that are making a difference in people's lives in those community. It's about our guest ranch. When our guests come to it, you know, we have 100 guests, 75 to 100 guests a week. Um, when they go home, they don't talk about, you know, the horses they rode and the experience they had to talk about their bonding with their families. And so the associates in each one of those cases, they feel like they're involved in a higher purpose in their lives than just making money. Making money is not, you know, is not, I mean, it's, it's okay, but it's not what life's about. Making a difference in people's lives through your work um, is, is very inspiring. So I would challenge our leadership team and still do and tell people, tell our leaders, it's, it's our responsibility to make our businesses, in this case, like the case of the Home Depot, where associates feel this company is worthy of my life. Not only that in a disrespectful way to religion or family or whatever, but that this is worthy of me really committing my time to, my passion to, my values to, my energy to, my family to, etc. As opposed to being invested in a company where P E ratio was the most important thing in life. It was other things, attachment to other people that really became critical. And with all of our businesses, it's going to be the same way. It is the same way and it will be the same way. Soccer will be exactly the same way as well. It'll be based on, you know, creating that that winning atmosphere for the fans. It'll be created for the fans, we'll create it internally for our players and our coaches and the organization. The league will be proud, we'll be proud, the soccer world will be proud of us and we'll get good results. But we're not going to focus first on getting good financial results. We're going to fir first focus on driving the right behavior. Well, that's great. Thank you. One These are uh, longer answers than you wanted, Daniel. Oh, that Sorry. was great. I love yeah, it. Thank okay. you so much yeah. for sharing that. Um, but kind of change tracks a little bit. So you have so much going on in your life. 
how do you balance everything and make sure that you're putting time where you need to put it, especially with Miss Angie and all that? Yeah, yeah, she wants to hear the job. answer to this question. <laughs> <laughs> She's taping it as well now. <laughs> whatever, whatever I say now, I'm going to be really careful. But uh, this is something I've always, I've really actually, it's been a kind of a, I wouldn't say a pet peeve of mine, but something I felt very strongly about. And there are a couple of uh, messages I would give to all the students here. And, and one is that you cannot compromise your family or family time along the way. I've seen, I mean, I've seen many associates at different levels in their life saying, well, I'll work really hard for the next 10 years and kind of say that to their spouse and sometimes to their kids. And, but I'll take care of the family, et cetera, but I'll kind of see you in the next 10 years. After that, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll be home after that. You know, those years come and go. And so you really can't, you really cannot give up time with your family. And I think you have to, you know, create time for yourself every day, whether it's be from a religious standpoint or a physical fitness standpoint or um, just to give yourself, you have to be able to refuel your own, own, own batteries. You got to be there for your family. Because if you're not, they will grow and they will grow away from you in many cases. Um, one of the greatest compliments that, you know, that I ever got is that when I retired in 2001, my oldest daughter was running a nonprofit organization in San Francisco. She couldn't make it back to Atlanta for the retirement dinner, and she did a videotape. During the videotape, she said, you know, Dad, I never realized till I got to university, really, how big the, the Home Depot was. Because, frankly, you were always there for me. You were always there at events, they're always there, important times in my life, et cetera, et cetera. And I would do, I would work very hard. I stopped playing golf for 17 years. I did a variety of things, but I would work around my kids' schedules. I'd get up early in the morning. I'd work late at night. I'd work all kind of weird hours to accommodate being there for them. So they never felt compromised by my success, if you will. That was a great compliment to me. So I would tell of our associates when I do reviews and what have you, and I'm doing one later today with David Homrick sitting in the second row as a UGA graduate, um, is that, you know, start with a clean calendar every month. You know, start with a clean calendar, put on your time for your family, put on your time for yourself. Uh, there'll always be time for meetings. There's never enough time for enough meetings. So a couple of meetings will fall off, but time for your family and time for yourself will not. I think that's a critical thing to do. So. Oh, great. I definitely admire that in you. I've definitely noticed you doing that. And I, Thank you. I, I appreciate that. that. Yeah. So I guess we have time for a few questions from the audience. I think we have um, somebody with a mic, Brock. So if you have a question, just raise your yeah. hand. We'll bring a mic to you and be able to ask. So I'm not really sure how to follow that. Um, but yeah. I, my name is Kyle Reed. I'm a junior Leonard Scholar here and also a marketing major. And I was just wondering, you know, all of us are mostly juniors and seniors. And so mm -hmm. what's kind of one piece of advice you could give us as we enter our professional careers and really start to move towards moving up the corporate ladder? Uh, the best advice I could give you or anybody else in school at this point is that don't focus on your resume, focus on your eulogy. Um, and so what, what, what do I mean by that? I, I, you as you build your career and your life, if you think about um, when, you're, when, you're, when you're gone, what, what is it you would want people to say about you that, when you're not here? And if you live that way throughout your life, in your business, career, and personally, you're gonna make a lot of good choices in terms of your values and your orientation and your principles and your standards. Um, so, you're going to, I mean, you're, you're all going to be very successful financially and what have you, but I would just strongly recommend you don't compromise your values and your principles, your integrity, your trust relationships along the way. Um, think about, you know, when I'm not here, what is it people are going to be saying about me? And when they're doing a eulogy, what is it I want them to say about me? And am I living my life every day? to match that eulogy. And if you're not, make other choices. And if you are, continue to reinforce those choices. Well, great. I think we had another question over here, Ben. Hi, I'm Adrian Obleton. I'm a sophomore MIS major. Uh, you mentioned a lot how the culture of the companies that you 
that you started were very important to you. Did you ever have a time where you had pushback on that culture, maybe when you were starting? And then if how so, how did you convince people that the culture would work before there were the results to prove it? Well, I, I think, I mean, we had, you know, we had a lot of tough business decisions to make. We, uh, we started the company uh, in 79. We went through half of our startup money in the first nine months. It was gone. Um, we, we had enough. We had, we were, you know, myself and the other principals, we were a fairly confident group, but we had a lot of inner humility. Uh, and humility drove us to listen to the customers and continue to respond to the customers. So we spent nine months while we we're losing all this money, uh, continuing to fine tune and remodel our stores and making sure we made adjustments in product mix and services and a variety of things and hours, just a variety of things the customers were telling us. We didn't reinterpret, we didn't refilter, we didn't argue with the customers, we just absorbed what they were telling us and responded to it. Um, and I think that, you know, we were never really um, challenged. It is a Falcons jersey. I like that one better than the Seahawks jersey. Thank you. That's good. Thank you. Um, so we never really challenged, I think, from a cultural standpoint. I, mean, I, I wouldn't say never. I mean, we had probably were times, I mean, there, there were times along the way when we had to make decisions about an associate or about a business or about the way we were approaching a supplier. Um, but I think looking back, you know, in, in retrospect, we, we really lived our culture. And I think another very quick story in that regard, um, probably a couple years before I retired, uh, McKinsey, uh, the senior HR partner, was living in Chicago then, writing a book, it was called War on Talent, um, War for Talent, I'm sorry. And they were interviewing, there were 10 companies uh, in the world they were actually interviewed. One was HD. And the partner came to, uh, see me last, they interviewed about 100 people in our company. Um, and from sales associates to lot engineers to store managers, division presidents, et cetera. And he came in and I remember sitting down in my conference room and he said to me, you know, I've been doing this for probably over 50 years now. He said, I've never met a company uh, ever where every place I went, everybody expressed the culture exactly the same way. Now, the words are a little different than yours or your partner's, but the essence of the culture was exactly the same. It's much like the Bob Tillman Lowe story I told you earlier, is that every place in our company, we had lived this culture, you know, and reinforced it every single day and didn't dilute. It wasn't a flavor of the year kind of cultural change. They heard the same thing, same thing for 23 years, never changed. And I think that um, that, that uh, was probably the most uh, powerful recognition that I ever received from outside of our organization that this culture had worked, is that they couldn't find anybody that didn't understand it and wasn't living it. So do we have any other questions right here? Um, first off, thank you so much for being here. I'm super excited thank to you. actually t ask a question. Um, but my name is Julia Hellman, and I'm a junior risk management and insurance major. And I'm sitting with some soccer fans now, and we are curious um, what you See think it. the future of um, MLS in Atlanta will be. I think it'll be great. We're excited. That April 16th of last year, we announced uh, that we're the 22nd franchise. Uh, I just came from New York. Uh, my fiance was with me, and and. Uh, my, uh, my middle son was with me, who's got an interest in soccer, along with Angie's children do as well. Um, and so we're, we're excited about being involved in, in MLS. We frankly were looking at it for probably 10 years. 10 years ago, there were only 14 teams in the league and half the teams were owned by two families. Uh, today, there are 20 teams competing. There's no team that's owned by more than one family. Today, the league itself is probably ranked number seven in the world. Uh, it wasn't then, it is now, and it's ascending. It continues to grow in every, every way. Quality of play on the field, probably most critically, but also in terms of attendance and TV ratings and things of that nature and sponsorship deals. So um, soccer fans are fanatical. Um, they understand what they like and they don't like, and we're a good listener. We've We've spent uh, a good part of the last uh, four or five months, we've hired a division, uh, division president, a president for MLS, Darren Eels, who comes from the Tottenham Spurs and EPL. So we uh, thinking very internationally and globally in terms of 
uh, procuring talent. Um, and we'll have a competitive team that'll be playing in, in 2017. And they'll open up our new stadium. So we're, we're very excited about that. I'm excited about the youth component as well. There's a requirement in MLS that you operate four teams, at least four teams yourself. And we're trying to figure out the best model to do that and how we can be a leader in supporting youth soccer in Atlanta, really, throughout the state as well. So. Lots of things happening in Atlanta. Um, yep. I think, did you have another one, Ben? Oh, that you, you already have? Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Marlene Middlebrooks, and I'm a freshman digital and broadcast oh, journalist. By, by the way, I didn't, answer, I didn't fully answer your question. What I, the, the last part I was going to comment on is that we actually, we, we got our name technically approved, we think approved by, by Major League Soccer. We spent six months talking to lots of fans in the soccer community about it. So if I announced it today, I'd have to kill you all or, or, or whatever. So I'm not, I'm not going to do that, but I think we have a name that reflects what our fans really want and one we're very comfortable with. So you'll hear about it shortly, we hope, and a branding that goes with it. Yes, ma'am, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, my name is Marlene Middlebrooks, and I'm a freshman journalism, uh, digital and broadcast journalism major but I'm also here covering the event for the Red and Black. And I was just wondering, did you have someone that kind of instilled these cultural values um, into you or that you learned these from, um, kind of like you're doing for us today? Yeah. Well, I think it starts, you know, in my own case, it started with my family, particularly my mother and my father. I lost my father when I was only 15. He was um, 44 at the time. Probably had more of an effect on me than I realized as a young man. My mother, who just passed away in, in January, January 8th. She was four months short of 100. Um, so I've, she has been an inspiration for me our whole life. We came from a very middle class family, lived in a single bedroom apartment. I didn't live in a home until I was 30, 31 years old. And I remember that home cost $31,000. And I remember telling my wife at that time is that I'll keep current the payments, but we'll never own the home. We'll never actually pay the debt off completely. So uh, times have changed, but um, <laughs> but I but <laughs> now we're building a 1.5 billion dollar stadium. So um, anyway, but uh, I, I think my mother probably had the greatest uh, influence on me. She's uh, she was a woman of great principle, a woman who believed in giving back in any way that she could. In her case, in our family's case, a lot of it was time, energy. Um, and, uh, and, and passion and, com and compassion for people. Um, and there were other people along the way from a business perspective that I learned life lessons from. Um, people like Charles Lazarus, who was the founder of Toys R Us, and my partner, Bernie Marcus, and Jack Welch, who was a close friend, who was a CEO of GE for many years. And at the time he was, he was the number one industrial company in the world. Um, so there are a lot of people I've learned from, and I think I've always had the ability, I think, to be a pretty good listener and to surround myself with people that knew more about a variety of things than I do and try to understand where they're coming from and, and uh, understand their viewpoints on things. And that's helped me grow a good bit. We have a few more minutes for a few more questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Blank. Uh, my name's John. I'm a risk management major. I'm a senior. And I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how you came to own the Falcons. Uh, yeah, well, actually, it's a, it's a long story. I'll make it real short. When I um, retired in 2001, I was a season ticket holder at club seats and would go to games. And uh, when I bought the team in, in uh, 2001, I didn't realize this at the time, but the closing, the commissioner said to me, you realize the, the Falcons never had back-to-back -back winning seasons. It was, the fr franchise had been in Atlanta since 66, so it was 36 years old at the time. And I said, well, that can't, that can't be correct. And I should have known better. He, Paul was the brightest guy in the room all the time. And um, I back and checked and found out he was right. And I, and I used to go to the games and, you know, they would win some, lose some, win some, lose some. And that kind of articulated itself into seasons that would win and lose, win and lose, win and lose. So my attitude was, you know, either I could sit here for the next 20 years and just, just buy tickets and complain or try to buy the thing and try to fix it. So um, I thought, you know, buying and fix it made more sense to me than sitting there and complaining. So um, when the, uh, uh, the owner of the, of the team was Rankin Smith, uh, he passed away several years later. 
One of my limited partners actually just passed away two days ago, or the day before yesterday, two days ago, um, was um, a limited partner of, of the Smith family as well. His name was John Imlay. Um, John had right of first refusal to own the team, and John and I knew each other and felt I'd be a perfect owner for the Falcons. And I had met Rankin Smith and spent some time with him and knew his, his oldest son, who was running the team at that time, as the president. So he developed a relationship with, um, with the Smith family, particularly the young man, Taylor. It took two or three years of um, visiting and chatting, and et cetera, et cetera. And um, you know, I told him I wasn't interested in buying a team at any sort of discount. Would pay whatever the fair, fair market value was. We independently hired uh, banking firms and came up with a, a value. Um, we were a little bit apart, so um, um, the funny part of the story is that I was in Dallas in a, another business meeting and he was a little nervous and so he was a um, single guy at that time so I called him Taylor I said why don't I, I'll meet you tonight in Atlanta we'll get a room at the Ritz and you and I will work out the last part of this deal together and I rented a big old suite there and and uh, we had dinner brought in and and uh, had a bottle of wine and and we finally agreed to the price, and he was single, so I said, I'm going to leave you in the suite in the room and do whatever you want with it tonight. And I had him sign on a napkin the price, and, and it was interesting because we had a, a um, uh, thing we would do at Home Depot when somebody committed to doing something, we'd make them sign on a cloth napkin what their commitment was. So I said to Taylor that night, I said, well, Taylor, I want you to write on this. You know, I, Taylor Smith, have agreed to sell the Falcons, and I would sign it as well. So he'd say to me, why do you want me to sign the napkin? I said, because we're going to commit to this tonight. I said, you have the right you know, to commit to it for your family. I obviously have the right as the principal owner to do this for the Falcons. So we, we signed the deal that night. That napkin is up at our museum at Flowery Branch that we, that we signed. So, so. Great. I think Brock had somebody back here. Hello. Um, thank you for being here. My name sorry. is Aya, and I'm an econ and international affairs major. Where, where are you? I'm sorry. Oh, they, okay, great. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yes, um, so my question is, being a successful businessman and um, many of your businesses being located in the Atlanta area, what are your outlook on Atlanta? You know, we are continuing to experience um, increasing in population growth and also growth in businesses, but at the same time, we suffer from transportation development. So what are your outlook on Atlanta? What is my, what on Atlanta? What, your outlook. outlook. My outlook. On yes. Well, I, I, I think it's great, but I think it's, it's been a struggle. I mean, I, when I moved to Atlanta in 78 uh, to launch our business in 79, there were a little less than a million people living in Atlanta, the six and a half million today in the Atlanta region. Um, and I think Atlanta um, has, has uh, struggled um, maintaining, in my opinion, the quality of life in certain areas in terms of transportation, in terms of public education, uh, in a variety of ways. And part of that is a result of just they've been so busy, Atlanta generally has been busy keeping up with the growth and being able to maintain any kind of inf infrastructure and housing and to just maintain the pace of support the growth that Atlanta has seen. So I think you know our, our our governor and governors and our mayor in Atlanta and leaders have tried now to focus more on how do you make sure the quality of life is uh, is at the level it needs to be so that companies today not only want to come here but want to stay here uh, because unlike when I was a younger man you know companies frankly uh, paid a lot less attention to what the associates really wanted it was you know it was what we're doing. You want to move, you got to move, you didn't have a lot of choices, et cetera. The associates today have much more say, thank heavens, in, in their life direction and their experiences, et cetera. So I think you have to earn, you know, Atlanta has to earn the right to keep companies here and to attract companies here. And in many cases today, CEOs are making those decisions today based on, you know, tell me about the public education. Tell me about the quality of the housing. Tell me about transportation. Am I going to spend my day in my car? You know, driving the next, you know, four miles is going to take me, you know, four and a half, you know, 45 minutes to do it. Um, so all those kinds of issues, I think, are very, very real. And I think Atlanta has to focus more on those things, the quality of life issues, um, in the future. 
to continue to maintain a, a healthy growth pace. We can grow, but you don't want it to grow in a way that, that's, not, that's not healthy. And in some ways, I think Atlanta has. Well, Mr. Blank, on behalf of the Terry College of Business and the Institute we all Leadership done? Advance, I think done we are. We're okay. about running yeah. out of time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank you well, on thank behalf you of the then. Terry College yeah. of Business and the Institute thank for you, Leadership buddy. Advancement thank for thank being here with us. Thank you. 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 Thank you.